so we are now starting our with our webinar whenever i see a patient it always uh, uh, comes to my mind uh, let's suppose you see a, a patient with uh, ca breast or any malignancy for that matter what best could i have done to the same person same patient if when she had come to me a year or two back always that is always run always runs in my mind so let us now listen to dr hema divakar because we are focused on coming to know mm -hmm. as to how better we can perform at our clinic sure. keeping prevention of malignancy in mind and uh, to introduce uh, dr hema divakar we have a very active women doctors wing uh, member dr hema uh, she is a consultant ophthalmologist and retina specialist and she is going to introduce dr hema divakar thank you ma'am thank you dr anuradha ma'am Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Hema Divakar because I worked with her also in the same department, being ophthalmology. So I welcome you, ma'am, for this uh, webinar. Uh, coming to the affiliations and organizational positions, Madam is a medical director of Divakar Specialty Hospital, CEO, Chairman of Artis, that is an Asian Research and Training Institute for Skill Transfer. Dean K C O G, Vice uh, Chair for F I G O Committee, two thousand fifteen till date. National Technical Lead F O G S, Manyata Delivering Quality Healthcare and Capacity Building. Madam also had chaired uh, as a past president of F O G S I, that is Federation of Obstetric and Gynecology Society of India, that is two thousand thirteen. Uh, an opinion a leader. an influencer for social and legal issues related to women's health and there are many awards and recognitions uh, uh, the main things being the FIGO women achiever award that is 2015 2018 global asian of the year excellence in women's healthcare and social entrepreneurship uh, award cme excellence award for artist and csr uh, times award uh for divakar service trust these are some of the uh, brief introduction about dr hema divakar uh she is a senior consultant and a past president of uh, fogsi and now the topic of uh, talk is uh, cancer in women awareness to action so with this a brief introduction i would like to uh, introduce madam dr hema divakar it's our privilege uh, for madam to be in our uh, seminar Uh, so welcome ma'am over to dr hema divakar thank you uh, thank you hema yeah um uh, can you hear me yes. hello everyone namaskara being an ophthalmologist you have seen hema through hema's eyes thank you for the kind introduction and uh, my very <laughs> beloved friend and colleague uh, dr anuradha when she sent an invite i did not look at when what how where if it is anu it has to be yes that was how uh, i am uh, a part of uh, this fine uh, afternoon and we are very proud of women from the wdw i am a branch of bengaluru uh, who have stepped forward for action because ladies and gentlemen we strongly believe just knowing is not enough the gap between the knowing and the doing has to be bridged that is very very crucial and my heartfelt thanks to dr vinay mamta satyavati uh, and of course himlata um, uh, besides uh, anu who has so kindly invited me permit me a moment to share my slide so we being routine obgyns are not experts like dr smita in the field of cancer management but like anybody from the ima anybody from any circuit of the medical fraternity to prevent and protect early that is the key and we need john i think you can mute so anybody who is involved um, in the patient care the awareness is both to 
the lay public out there and also to the peer group as how we are going to be discussing today. So the key issues that I'm going to discuss because Smita is the next distinguished speaker is going to speak about the ovarian cancer. So I will restrict in the limited time uh, my talk to what is so, so very preventable, which all of us should know and should take action. That is the issue of cervical cancer. What can help if we self-examine and detect early? That's all about the breast cancer. And of course, in the female reproductive organs, the leftovers are the endometrium and the ovaries. I'm only going to be addressed very shortly. So very, very briefly, I'll touch upon the endometrium cancer as well. So much to speak about awareness. Once when uh, I was on a talk show and then I was asking the, uh, somebody, um, are you aware of uh, something called the cervical cancer? Uh, do you know what's a cervix? And uh, there were many, not one, but at least four or five women out there said, yes, yes, doctor, we all have had cervical spondylosis. So we know what a cervix. So they couldn't even, you know, relate to the fact that the neck of the uterus uh, alludes to what we call a cervix in our medical parallels. So dear friends, the awareness starts right from there because it is not an organ that they can see and relate to. Many, many women will know Garbachila or the uterus, but they may not necessarily know what the cervix is. So the education and economic status also makes a huge difference in uh, seeking care even after they're aware and in countries like ours we need to be very very uh, cautious about the fact of the gender inequity because of women oftentimes even in the nutritional spheres we say that she eats least and she eats last and she really doesn't bother to take care of herself or seldom she's hesitant to tell her family members what she's going through and as Anu said they push it as far ahead as possible and always, always a thought in the clinician's mind is, I have missed the bus. Could I have seen her earlier and could I have done any better? So coming to the cervical cancer, luckily the scientific breakthrough has told us that HPV or human papilloma virus, that's the one and only cause of the cervical cancer. That means there can be no cervical cancer without the infection with the human papilloma virus. And we often tell the patients that just like polio is caused by polio virus and then you take the polio drops and then you get rid of it, it is HPV is the single most uh, causative reason for the cervical cancer. And of course, it has lots of cousins in its groups, the high risk and the low risk category, out of which what we have bracketed here, the 16 and 18, these are the most potentially notorious ones, okay, who um, uh, are responsible for more than 90% of the cervical cancer. So how does this all happen and how long does it take? So here are normal cervical cells. So I told you that unless they're infected by the HPV virus, there can't be a cervical cancer. It's not as if they're infected today and tomorrow or within a few weeks, they will turn into cancer. No, they will take at least a decade, maybe over 10 years to slowly, if it persists, if this infection persists, it will make the cell structure change into precancerous slowly, very, 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 very slowly, tortoise snail pace, as we call it, progress into cervical cancer. So we have time from the time of infection, which can, of course, clear out of its own. It's like having repeated tonsillitis. You know, if you get the tonsillitis, you also get cured of that. And again, you can potentially get reinfected. Similarly, it's a sexually transmitted virus on and off, on and off. And one unfortunate time, if it stays there, it, the body, if it cannot get rid of the HPV virus, slowly over the years, it'll turn into the cervical cancer. So best is to stop the entry itself. If you vaccinate the young girls 10 to 12 years old, the normal cells will remain normal cells because entry of this HPV will have a barrier with the 
vaccines that will fight it out. The second opportunity is the screening. You have to take a sample of these cells and find out if they're still normal cells or if they have HPV infection or have they turned into precancerous cells or do the cells show a frank cancer. So this is the process. So as I said, vaccination of end adolescent is the one which prevents and the screening, the earlier you find out, even in the precancerous stage or you know, it's tending towards cancer, then you can still do away with the entire uterus cervix and do a you know extended surgery and deroute it from the body. No woman should ever die of cervical cancer. That is the campaign, and we want, like how the polio has been eliminated, we want to eliminate the HPV by a mass vaccination program so that by in the Western world, they're hoping 2030, they'll be able to get rid of the HPV infection per se, whereas countries like ours may perhaps take a little more time. But even in the terms of screening and reducing the death rate by early pickup and early action from awareness to action, we can certainly do a lot more better. How many women we need to screen? Of course, the entire population who is sexually active. Any time between uh, 16, 18 years to uh, the uh, menopause, the, every three years, the screening should go on. So 100% would be the right answer. But how many are we actually screening in our country? Less than about 5 to 7%. So we are aware, but it is still calling for a lot more action. So how do you detect these HPV viruses? Well, this is the whole sequence of events. Women who have had sex with HPV infected men, within weeks to months, they will develop the, if they have developed the HR or high risk HPV infection, within some months, if it stays there, they will develop what is called a persistent high risk HPV infection. If this persists long enough, then they will develop high grade cervical lesions, which will go on to become cancer cervix. So again, please do recall and remember that we have so much time and opportunity from awareness to action. So how do we check on this? Well, the old time testing is the pap smear or the cytology. We actually have to take the cells out there, study it under the microscope, see if they're normal, see if they're precancerous, see if they've already turned into cancers. Another way is, is the environment in infected with HPV. So this is the new ERA test. Sometimes the pap smear can miss, whereas the HPV, it gives us a yes or no answer. It has a very, very high degree of sensitivity. So slowly, the screening methodologies are turning from just a visual inspection. Just see the cervix with a speculum examination. It's not looking normal. It is angry red. It's got some lesions. Well, that is your yes or no answer already. This is the very basic VIA, as it's called, visual inspection. The next thing is the cytology. Just take the, scrape the cells, send it for testing, and you figure out whether the cells are normal or not. The last and the best thing, which is now recommended as the sole primary screening test, is the HPV testing itself. And if the HPV comes positive, then you back it up with a cytology to enhance the uh, detection rate. So LPC is liquid-based cytology. That is one of the way we do the pap smear. We can also opt to do the HPV PCR test alone, or you can do a co-testing, a combination of both. If the patient is in, it's good enough if you just do the HPV test and leave it there because you'll be still missing about three out of 25 patients. So in a huge cohort, they found 14,000 patients who would be missed. But if you combine the test, that is first you do a HPV, if it's positive, then you do the cytology, then there are very few patients who could be missed. So a combination test, if the first test is positive, follow it up with cytology. So just look at from awareness to action, if you haven't bridged the gap, this is the data from the best, 2012. 8 million people who were not screened for five years. So some of their cervical cells surely would be 
precancerous or cancerous, then seven out of 10 women who had not been screened had a day, regular doctor's checkup. Not that they didn't come to the doctor. They came, but we didn't use that opportunity to screen. And because we did not screen, we missed out the diagnosis on a significant number of patients. So if screening is enough, then why vaccinate? That's the next question that anybody would ask. Just look at the data here again. If you only vaccinate, the vaccines available today in the whole group of the cousins that I showed of HPV, the two main runners are 16 and 18. Yes, vaccine is available against 16 and 18. But there are a bunch of other little, little different numbers of HPV viruses. The vaccine is available only against nine of them. So even if you vaccinate, if you do not screen, you will still miss a small percentage. So half the number are certainly covered, but if you use a combination of the vaccination and still screen, you will significantly pick up each and every case and really, really not miss many cases. So that is the importance of primary prevention of vaccination. You please ask each and every one of your young girls and young women whether they're vaccinated or not. That's, of course, the first action step that each one of us have to take. And the follow-up screening every three years, most likely that because the HPV infection itself is prevented, you'll have less and less numbers with the abnormal cells. But even if you do have them, you'll be able to detect them early and take action. So cervical... Cancer is the only type of HPV cancer which is there is for which there is a recommended screening test. Pre-cancer for other HPV-related cancers may require invasive testing and treatment because HPV is a virus which is 100% responsible for cervical cancer, but it can also cause oral cancer, anal cancers, and so on. So 90% of HPV cancers, no matter wherever the infection is, Primary focus, we are focusing on talking about cervix. But if there is anal cancer or vulval cancer or oral cancer because of HPV, 90% of them are also preventable. So once you get the vaccine, there is a whole range of HPV-related cancers that you will be able to control. So today is an era where we are talking about vaccinations. Polio, I already mentioned, COVID-19, we desperate to procure the vaccine and give it to everybody. But... Look at this, the HPV vaccine, it has been available. We are aware of that. Have we acted upon mass immunization of all our girls and women in the quest that we will prevent cervical cancer? The answer is quite clearly no, because hardly 15% of our girls and women in our own country have received the HPV vaccination so far. HPV, just like COVID, does not discriminate by age or neither does the vaccination discriminate by age. In India, 60,000 women lose their lives to cervical cancer every year. Believe me, each and every one of those 60,000 deaths could have been prevented by vaccination and screening for sure. Women remain at risk for acquiring HPV infections throughout their lifetime. As I said, HPV comes and HPV goes, Again, it comes, again, it goes. But if it comes and it stays, then it will move on to cancer. As for majority of cervical cancer patients, they are in the age group of 40 plus. So between 20 and 40, there is enough time for you to see what kind of cells changes are occurring. And of course, enough time for you to vaccinate. So four, nine to 45 years is the recommended age for cervical cancer prevention as in the vaccines. And they have proven efficacious even in the mid-adult women because even if it's a precancerous, it will just arrest it there. It will then reduce the viral load so that the cancer cannot progress and that in itself changes the prognostic value. Again, this vaccine has been globally acknowledged vaccine. It's a result of many, many years of research and development, not few months, but many years, rigorous studies and Zero breakthrough cases have been reported in the last 14 years. 
of follow-up after giving the vaccine. So safety of the vaccines has been reiterated by renowned global organizations inclusive of the WHO. And here you will see inclusive of FIGO, FOXY, all those ABCD, which Himlaka read out, all the organizations have endorsed that HPV vaccine is here to stay. And more than 300 million doses have been given worldwide in the last couple of years. So vaccine hesitancy is more in the provider's mind than in the ones who actually take the vaccine. So from awareness to action, let us move for making the HPV vaccination available, especially to adolescent girls. Why? Because there are four main reasons. Higher immune response in adolescents versus the young adults. Immunizing before the exposure can give the highest possible efficacy. Why? Because before the sexual activity, if you give this at the age of 10, 11, 12, for which the vaccination has been approved, the huge immune response mounted, the HPV virus is not even allowed an entry into her uh, system. Therefore, uh, that is the best way to protect. And the high risk for acquiring HPV infection is that even with the first male partner, remember, infected male partner will cause the um, HPV to enter her system. And it may be the very first one because multiplicity of partners is blamed for development of cervical cancer. Even if she does not have multiple partners or the male may have many partners, who, which is unknown to her, whatever the social circumstances that before the exposure, if you vaccinate, it's the ideal situation. Cost of immunization, of course, is less in most of the adolescents who need just two doses instead of three. So the recommended vaccination schedule, at least start talking to every parent about this and every newborn female child, please put this as one of her last vaccines in the childhood vaccination schedule by the age of 10 or 11. That's the time you give the two doses. You give the first dose today and after six months, you give the second dose and that covers for the rest of the lifetime. Suppose maybe even in the COVID situation, there are so many instances where the second dose has been delayed. So the dictum is, if the vaccine schedule is interrupted, the whole of the course need not be repeated. Maximum one year to four years interval, you can still give the second dose, which is a booster dose in the adolescents. But if the age is more than 15 and up to 26, then she will require an additional dose at two months as well. So zero dose, two months, and six months. Because the immune response, which a 25-year-old female will mount, is far less than what a 12-year-old will mount. So 12 years requires only two doses, one primary and one booster. Whereas if she's 20 or 25, you have to push one more additional dose so that to make sure the immune system recalls its memory and the vaccination proves useful. Even beyond 26, even if there is a good chance that already she is in a precancerous state, it is licensed for use until the age of 45. If very, very likely, as most of our women would have missed the dose, they can still take this up to the age of 45 years, after which, until then, she has escaped of the HPV infection. Very unlikely. I always explain to them that a tubectomy or a sterilization operation or a long-term permanent mode of contraception, we would rather give it to a 25 or a 35-year-old rather than a 55-year-old female. So that's the kind. Where the more the age, the lesser the chances. If till then the cells are normal, if till her age of 45 cells are normal, it's likely that it will remain normal because many times the HPV would have come in and out of her. She has handled it. Her immune system is capable. So after 45, maybe on an individual basis, you may discuss and give it to her, but generally not needed. So the best chance is the earliest chance, 11 to 15 years. After 15 years, until 45 years, with the three doses covered, that is the schedule for vaccination. Let's not presume it's too costly. People have paid 10 times, 20 times the cost for remdesivir, oxygen cylinders, this, that, because they have recognized that health is wealth and they need not save their wealth at the cost of their health. So you please motivate them to 
get the, I'm, I'm sure if the volumes, if the whole of the IMA takes up and each and every girl and women less than 45, there'll be at least 400 million doses that we will need to cover in the next two years, then the cost obviously will come down. So make cervical cancer vaccine a part of your routine discussion, make it a routine for your paramedical staff as well to keep on talking to the patients and train your paramedic staff to tell them a few things and guide them into this phase of awareness and let them decide. And it is the doctors or the healthcare providers many times they feel, oh, it is too costly, how will my patient be? But at least tell her and let her decide because we've had, after some television programs, etc., even the street vendors, you know, saving their money and coming for their vaccination. You know, so you don't know what their perceptions and the priorities are. So please make them aware so that they take action. You please be aware so that you will also take a proactive action. So uh, having said this much about cervical cancer, I'm particularly not touching upon once the cervical cancer sets in, what you need to do to deal with it, because most often, either a primary vaccination or a screening by pap smear, detection and removal of the cervix, upper half of the vagina, uterus, or extended surgery, um, if we uh, refer to a gynae oncologist, Sad to say that Kidby Memorial has reported the largest number of very advanced cervical cancers which could have landed at their doorstep a year or two earlier if they were detected on time. Many of them uh, have gone beyond the stage of surgery and then radiotherapy and chemotherapy is the only way out. So let's not even talk about that because we want lesser and lesser and lesser patients in that group, whether rural or urban, make them aware and guide them for the next action. What are the other cancers in women? You see that cervical cancer was ranking the first in 1982. Now in the Western countries, at least because of vaccination, etc., it has come down quite a bit, but the breast cancer, which is again the second uh, largest amount of cancer has now gone up in its ranking. Cervical cancer has reduced, but breast cancer has moved up. But in our country, I must say that all kinds of cancer which could be uh, prevented or detected early are all rampant. And these are just numbers, but uh, every single individual case which could have a preventable or an early detection and ensuring quality of life, we must never ever miss the chance. So 1 million new cases in the world every year of the breast cancer, that's the topic we are moving on to from the cervical cancer. And it, is one, it has now become one of the most common malignancies. In our country, of course, the breast and cervical cancer are running neck to neck because we haven't done enough about the cervical cancer issue. And uh, the death rates are higher uh, for these than any other. One in eight women in UK will face breast cancer in their life. And what makes them prone to that? If a woman is older than 50, she's got dense breast, early age of first period, late menopause, long-term hormone therapy, previous cancer diagnosis, like if she has uh, cervical cancer or uh, ovarian cancer, then it's an oncogenic gene is very much uh, present in her. Relatives with breast cancer, genetic mutations, which will um, prompt you to diagnose the breast cancer. So we know that someone's chances of developing breast cancer are a affected by a combination of the genes and the lifestyle choices and the events throughout their life, like, like the early, menopause, uh, early uh, menarche and late menopause, there's never a single cause for this disease. Unlike in the cervical cancer, we have only one single cause, HPV virus. That's it. Whereas in breast cancer, there are an array of causes which are uh, unfortunately in combination or a standalone prompt to the development of breast cancer. Uh, one more thing about the cervical cancer vaccine, you can give it even to the lactating women. So every single patient who delivers, please guide her throughout her pregnancy about the HPV vaccine and uh, uh, please urge her to take it before she leaves the hospital. That's what we are also doing uh, both in pregnancy and in lactating women with the COVID vaccine as well. 
So um, the signs that a woman has to watch out for for breast cancer are whether a lump is felt in the breast or the nipples are inverted, there is a nipple discharge, nipple pain, soreness of nipple in areola, just below her armpit if there is a swelling, all of these uh, will have to alert her to come to the doctor. And one of the key things which we must absolutely, absolutely not fail to tell any of the patient is the self-examination because that is the best chance for early pickup and survival. So encourage everyone to be breast aware. And these simple posters, you can put it up in your clinics as well. So they have to check it once a month, two, three days after the period. They have to examine the breasts and the armpit area, use the finger pads and uh, both in the up and down direction or wedges or in circles. And they have to stand in front of the mirror and see for any dimpling of the skin or the lumps, which may be so visible. And all of these simple illustrations will at least raise a suspicion in the women's mind herself. And then she comes to you, then you can back it up and figure out by your clinical examination beyond the self breast examination. So usually a mammography or a sonogram or an MRI uh, will be used both for diagnosis and surveillance and the risk avoidance. Generally, the lifestyle advice is given, but it directly or indirectly impacts the overall well-being, but you cannot prevent it just by diet and exercise control. Tamoxifen and raloxifen are the drugs which they use as a uh, preventionary precaution and uh, bilateral prophylactic mastectomy is sometimes done uh, in a few cases where the oncosurgeon suggests the same. So the breast cancer experience is far beyond the breast tissue itself because changes in sexuality and sexual desires, premature menopause, infertility, a lot of social issues like occupational changes, financial hardships, changes in relations with family and friends and uh, the uh, mental and emotional changes. There is a lot happening around the issues of breast cancer, uh, except that we need to encourage them positively for a better lifestyle to help them cope with this. So once again, we need to celebrate our survivors and for that, an early detection and early action from awareness to action is what it is. We believe that if we act now by 2050, everybody who develops a breast cancer will live if they are supported well enough. Last two, three slides, just to touch and go about the endometrial cancer, the inner lining of the uterus, the fifth most common cancer in the women worldwide. It, about 40,000 new cases every year with about 7,000 deaths. So not so bad, but still it can be detected early and uterus, cervix, breast, these are the organs which can be, in fact, even the ovaries can be removed out of your system. So that means you're derouting the cancer if you detect early and then you save lives. There is a strong association with the endometrial cancer and obesity and therefore we are harping on that lifestyle. Here again, the early menarche or late menopause, infertility, obesity. Treatment of breast cancer with tamoxifen indirectly influences the development of uh, uh, the endometrial cancer. Diabetes, which is a tsunami, um, and especially even in the age groups younger than 40 years, we have gestational diabetes going on to type 2 diabetes. And if they have a personal history of breast or ovarian cancer, they're also prone to endometrial cancer because uh, the oncogenic genes, as I said. But overall, right from the start, if we encourage them for uh, the more fibers in the diet, some things which everybody can do for a better lifestyle and uh, which causes uh, increased um, estrogen uh, excess and the isoflavones, which is... Uh, fine way of uh, uh, replacement of estrogen because these are phytoestrogens which have properties similar to selective estrogen receptor modulators. It's a simple thing to do whether you believe it or not, the soy, the beans, the chickpeas, etc., which uh, potentially they can modify the risk. So the symptoms of this is non-menstrual bleeding or discharge or very heavy bleeding. And if it has 
extended to the neighboring regions, then dysuria, painful intercourse, um, pain or mass in the pelvic area, weight loss, back pain, etc. So caution all your patients about uterine cancer that if there is an abnormal bleeding of any sorts, they cannot presume and assume that it is just some hormone fluctuations, they have to live with it, and this normally happens. No, they have to come for a checkup and you have to check it out whether there are more ominous reasons for this. The new cases are rising and more in the Asians, which are detected late and they have to lose their lives. And after menopause or in between the periods or post-coital bleeding, as we call, all of these need very, very special attention. So the diagnosis is not only by examination, but pap smears, endometrial biopsies, the dilatation and period touch. And of course, as the sixth sense of OBGYNs is the ultrasound, especially the transvaginal ultrasound. So treatment, of course, I said, early detection, the best option is to remove everything which is aligned to that system. The hysterectomy, cyping ovarectomy, lymph node dissection, it can even be done through the laparoscopy, radio, chemo, hormonal therapy. We always, always seek the help of our oncology colleagues because every year the protocols are changing, newer uh, advances are coming in. So may the best be done once you have detected. So the survival rates, if you pick it up in stage one, there's a 90% survival. Rate. So again, we go back to the point early detection, is the best thing to do. So the precancerous hyperplasia, it's not yet gone into cancer, but it can, the excess estrogen can be countered by progestin and the DNC can confirm whether it's going into what's malignancy and the uh, few of them who develop untreated cancer can be detected early. So at the gist of it, we can say definitely that awareness plays a very, very important role. So talking to them, giving the visual aids, now there is so much. That's why the first slide started with a mobile because there is so much on the WhatsApp university. Let the right messages percolate and pervade and there is so much information on the social media that can be given. So the awareness and mass campaigns, uh, we would urge each one of you to amplify it as a ripple effect so that it just the volume and the noise levels escalate so that everybody is aware here hey, or to, you know, take care. And because this are also something that are preventable and early detection can also make a lot of difference. So we must pledge and say that together, if we move from awareness to action, we can have a handle and control the menace of the three types of cancers that I mentioned, which are very special to our gender. May the girls and women of this country be in the pink of health, thanks to all of you in your own capacity. If you move from awareness to action, we are sure to have a healthier generation and a prosperous country. Namaskar. Thank you, Hema. Well, uh, I am very, very passionate about disease prevention. And during our undergraduate, community medicine was something which was which uh, which we all took very lightly. And now the COVID pandemic has taught all of us that uh, we need to concentrate on the preventable aspects also. So here, uh, Dr. Hema, you have been speaking to an array of doctors of different specialties. You have a pediatrician, you have a, a, an oncologist, you have a, a not necessarily an obstetrician. So a uh, lot of uh, take home messages for all of us, uh, lady doctors. Yes, yes, yes. We have to remember that any lady uh, patient that we meet, we'll have to uh, remind them about breast self-examination. And we have to remind ourselves that uh, a lady's checkup is not complete without a per, uh, per vaginal and a per speculum examination. And scan does, just doesn't mean doing an abdominal scan for a woman, as Hema put it, to check the endometrial thickness, we have to get a transvaginal scan also. And she also mentioned that in the outpatient department, we can, as in the OPD, we can still 
take care of prevention of cervical cancer by doing VIA, visual inspection after using acetic acid. Simple step that you and me need to do in the prevention of cancer. And of course, in the pandemic, we have realized the importance of not looking at the cost because here Dr. Naveen has messaged about the cost of HPV vaccination. Well, it came to my mind that all patients took remdesivir in, 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 uh, injection in the black market and so definitely that is a lesson to all of us that the onus is on the patient and not on us. I'm not going to decide whether it's costly or not. So now there are uh, three comments in the chat box uh, as of now and three more now. Uh, the first uh, question what Dr. Naveen is asking is the biggest barrier to HPV vaccination is the cost. What is FOXY and MOH and uh, FW doing about it? And one more uh, comment of his comments on CA cervix in postmenopausal women. What percentage of CA cervix is seen in postmenopausal women? Is it usually diagnosed at a later stage? Because many women believe that they can't get it after menopause. Hema, you're muted. Uh, in, in response to what um, uh, the FOXY and um, the ministry is doing, unfortunately, we've been battling with the ministry, central ministry, for more than 15 years now, right from the introduction of the HPV vaccine in the country. And every time I used to be, Madam, don't come here to sell your vaccine. So I said, no, sir, I'm not coming to sell the vaccine. I'm going to... uh, then, you know, they said we've made calls to 250 OBGYNs. And they don't seem to be believing that uh, it is so worthwhile. So that's why I said the forums like these still are very important because only 15% of our girls and women are covered with the HPV vaccine, even as we speak today. There's an immense scope to escalate. And now the costs have come down. Only two doses if you give it to the girls. It's well within 5,000 rupees or even lesser if you buy it in bulk and pass on the, uh, you know, the concessional advantage to the girls themselves. And there are many NGOs and organizations. It is for us to sensitize them that this is a useful cause. When they say adolescent care, they're always talking about anemia, deworming, lifestyle, contraception, life skills, and HPV vaccination. So if you have that 330 million uh, adolescents uh, will benefit from this and, uh, uh, you know, in collaborative partnership, yes, we can find out the uh, ways and means of reducing the cost. If cost, we think is a barrier, but when we took a survey, 83% of them said that 2000 rupees per dose per vaccine is quite okay. 83% said that it is quite okay because we say only two doses and it's a once in a lifetime. So they were okay with that. So let's not be biased about the perception. And the MOH and the FOXY now in the last eight years have recommended uh, the vaccinations uh, for the um, age group and the, in the dosages that I have just mentioned. So that much action has happened. Now it's for us to reach it to the girls and women. And about the late detection, menopausal women. See, they are obviously harboring. If, if she is menopausal at 48, and then she has a postmenopausal bleed, and that is why she has come to you and you have picked up a cervical cancer, this has not come in after her menopause. This is sitting there since the last 15 years. First of all, you could have vaccinated. Second of all, you would have done three early pap smear, you would have picked up the abnormal cells. In the recent past, HPV test also would have, you know, uh, picked up the, um, uh, you know, in that sense, an early detection. And certainly, certainly, the late diagnosis could have been avoided. Even in Ayushman Bharat and all, they're covering the cervical cancer treatment. But what we are telling the government is encourage vaccinations. Get the screenings in place. Then you'll have less and less women reaching you for advanced cancer care where you're investing a lot of Ayushman Bharat money. Save that and put it where it is needed for prevention rather than for the care of advanced cancer. So that is the scenario presently. And I think the COVID has uh, given us a, a good sense of courage to amplify our advocacy and noise levels with the government that for women and girls, we really want this moving. So we are at it, uh, uh, Naveen, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Dr. Dhanlakshmi's uh, question is, what is the duration gap between vaccination to conception? 
Uh, okay. So if she's vaccinated today and she falls pregnant, you know, in the next next cycle itself or next in, in the next two, three months, then you know that at two months and six months for her next two doses of vaccine. So you delay that second dose until she delivers. So you don't have to start all over again with the three doses. So that is what it is because at around 26 well, 15 years to 26 years, we said we, you can, uh, you will still need to give three doses. So if you take the vaccine, there is no need to cover with the contraception per se for the six months until she finishes the second dose. If she falls pregnant inadvertently, the dosages can be deferred to until after pregnancy because theoretically in the modeling studies, even as late as five years it's been given, it has the same booster impact. So that that is how it is, yeah. Yeah, uh, Hema. Again, Dr. Naveen's comment on uh, uh, lady doctors need to stress about uh, uh, prostate cancer prevention with uh, doing the uh, uh, blood test. Uh, see, uh, as also lady doctor, uh, male doctors stressing on CA breast prevention by self breast examination and uh, Pap smears and all that. Yeah, this is a very correct uh, societal question because if a lady goes to a male uh, practitioner, um, uh, you know, they may misunderstand that uh, I have come for some other reason and why is this doctor checking my breast? You know, so it, it sends a kind of a wrong signal if I may say so. So you have to just give them the posters, flyers, pamphlet, food, and say that for every woman, this is really, really important. See, you can do it yourself. There are so many YouTube, uh, you know, channels which are giving uh, gnan on uh, this. So at least you start telling that even if you don't examine, it's fine. If she has a concern and she comes back to you and tells you that, no, it looks like something, then you can always send her uh, to your colleague gynecologist who, if she's comfortable uh, in that sense for examination by a, a female specialist, then so be it, you know. So, but you have to facilitate uh, this uh, process instead of, uh, yeah, instead of we ourselves uh, shying away. Yeah, Hema, a lot of appreciation to you for your talk. And I acknowledge presence of our... Uh, See, here in Canada, the, the vaccine is given in elementary school. Yeah. That is our dream, Dr. Raj. That is really our dream. We are going to reach there very soon uh, because the campaign is now getting massive. It's getting louder. We want... Uh, because even for rubella, we went... The catch-up vaccine for rubella for all the girls... You know, we went to massive, uh, you know, campaign in the schools and we did cover them up. Now, of course, MMR vaccine, so rubella is covered uh, for all the children in the primary immunization itself. But we had a phase where we had to run to the schools to give the rubella. So the same way, the HPV, if it doesn't get done, because it's a gray zone, she's neither with a pediatrician nor with a gynecologist. So that's the thing. So even in the school, it can be given in the school campus itself because there are no alarming side effects of the uh, vaccine. So it can definitely be uh, offered. So uh, the schools also be asking them to do a health uh, tie up with the insurance uh, agency. So that for all the routine things, inclusive of obesity and uh, such issues, they are comprehensively tied up. And through that agency, uh, we uh, are trying uh, to make them aware that this is important. They can take it in the school, off the school, wherever. But that is a key. But government is not easily uh, agreeable to this as of now because this is not on their priority list because they are again telling me, Pele anime hatao, neto aap hat jao. <laughs> so that is that is a kind of scenario, you yes. know. So uh, it, it is a big battle because for us in girls and women's healthcare, we uh, uh, go as a great activists uh, to campaign for our issues, but they have a lot many more issues, including nutrition, sanitation, supply chain, food fortification, malaria, tuberculosis, and whatnot. So it's it's a it's a battle, uh, but uh, we have to fight it out. Yeah. Yeah, Hema, one more question: uh, vaccination for boys. The transmission of the infection is from male partners. So, what's your comment? Uh, of course. Vaccination for boys is recommended. Um, see, gender neutral vaccination, it's called GNV. That has already come up in Australia. Okay. But here, what we are saying is, I said in the first or second slide itself, 
that we have to look at everything with a gender lens because women are denied. They are still looked at. We are in the metros and educated, empowered. We have a right to decide for ourselves. But it doesn't happen in more than 75% of our country. Even educated women in the north of India, they are not allowed to decide for themselves. So if we make it a priority for you know, gender neutral, then more likely that many, many boys will get it, the girls will still be denied. But like how the male contraception has not stood the test of time. There's only 1% undergoing the vasectomy. What? It's a women's problem. She gets pregnant and then all the risks are hers. You know, it's nothing to do. So men participating in the uh, contraceptive process beyond the HIV threat and the barrier contraception, the permanent method of contraception, it has not come into the forefront. Similarly, similarly, cervixes in the women, she is going to get affected finally. Of course, there are uh, the anal and penile uh, cancers in the men, which are also partly contributed by the HPV. So first, 80% of our girls and women are covered. Then certainly the government can think of embarking on you know, the you know, public health measure of giving the boys also. But the gender neutral vaccination program, if that dream becomes a reality, HPV will be eliminated by 2030, 2050 for sure. Because then everybody is mass vaccinated, just like the polio example. Then that will, but we have a little bit of a journey to reach that point. Yeah? Uh, patients will sell uh, gold and property when they're sick to save their lives, but to prevent mm. life threatening diseases. There is, yeah, but because this is my last comment, Anu, that yes. uh, uh, if you are reluctant, they are reluctant. That's what I would like to say. If you tell with conviction, hey, this is good, this is really, you know, because even vaccine hesitancy for COVID, even today, they're all in the villages and all, whole, whole village are running away. They're not being available for vaccines at all. So if we say with conviction, without a clash, all the professional organizations have agreed, but we have to break the silos. If they go and ask an orthopedic, they say, no, maybe it may not be like that. So if everybody speaks with the same tone and tenor and the same voice, take it, take it, take it. Then there's no escape. They will take it. <laughs> so uh, I think the, slowly the preventive healthcare the COVID has brought to the forefront. Let's encash on that. And when the COVID vaccine is going strong, the uh, unfinished agenda of HPV also, this is the right moment for us to encash. Thank you so very much for this wonderful opportunity. I really enjoyed the afternoon. Thank you.